Hello everyone, this is Mirko Guerrini and I welcome you to the Jazz Transcription Clinic, a monthly interviews podcast where we talk with accomplished jazz doctors about their lives, career and their personal secrets on the art of transcribing. If you want to improve at jazz, stay tuned and follow the Jazz Transcription Clinic on the socials for more content. I acknowledge the traditional owners of the land on which this podcast is being recorded. I pay my respects to their elders, past and present, and the Aboriginal elders of other communities who may be here today. Hello everyone and welcome to another episode of Jazz Transcription Clinic. And it's a big honor for me today to have the guest jazz doctor uh, talking to you uh, as Julian Wilson from Melbourne, Australia. So Julian is one of the first tenor saxophone player I heard in Australia ever. And I was completely blown away by his playing. And I remember the second night, probably, I heard Tony Hicks, who is another exceptional tenor saxophone player in Melbourne. Hopefully he will be uh, one of the next guests to this podcast. But when I heard, you know, first Julian Wilson and then Tony Hicks, I thought to myself, oh, I'm in trouble. If I if I move out here, it's going to be tough. Because those guys are really great. And what impressed me about Julian is that he didn't sound at all uh, American. He sounded uh, very, very personal and, and original. So Julian has already achieved an exceptional career. And you can listen to Julian playing in over 80 albums. And I will put the links to his website and his all social uh, media uh, in the podcast description. And he won an incredible number of awards. I'm really jealous, but they are all super well deserved, I'm pretty sure. And he's an established uh, player, composer, and also publisher in Melbourne because he founded his own uh, label and he publishes constantly a lot of music contributing to the development of the Australian jazz scene and to the uh, also the, the, the share into the world of the Australian jazz scene. So it's a big honor. I'm so happy that Julian accepted my invitation to this podcast and uh so welcome julian thanks thanks for having me america thanks for that beautiful introduction uh it's, it's really uh i i remember exactly it was at bennett's lane when ben, bennett's lane was still uh there it was probably 2008 and then uh, there was a student, a uh, Monash University student, who organized a gig with uh, yourself and myself in it because this student thought that we were a, a, a good combination of players. And I was very, very nervous that night. Because, you know, <laughs> when you play with someone that plays like you, oh, it's, oh, man. <laughs> You're too kind, man. Hey, I got a question for you, Mirko. Yeah. Um, you, it's funny because I, um, it's a question starting with a statement. First of all, I studied with Tony when I was in high school when I was studying the Bach cello suites, the classical. Right. We talked about before, and um, you said I didn't sound like any of the American guys, which is interesting because uh, it's funny. Often I get a review and they mention a bunch of guys I don't listen to. Yeah. <laughs> rather than the guys I do, you know how that happens. Yeah. But um, I wondered if you heard a similarity between Tony and I, because I w was studying with him in such a strong part of my development when I was 16, you know? Uh, I think so. Now that, that, that you say it, I can, I can hear that there are some similarities, but it's more the creative approach to improve. You know, there is a melodic taste that is probably more European. So I, I loved you guys and I still love you guys because uh, probably you, you remind me of my uh, own heritage. 
you know that the uh, Europe is where I was raised. Uh, but it's, it's more the fact that you can play anything, and I think I can recognize you. You know, if someone oh, I know where it comes from, but that it, that it's me, you mean? Yes, if yeah, someone no, makes a, like a blindfold test and plays a recording where you are playing, I probably now would be able to to pick you up because first is the tone, of course, and your tone is a bit different from Tony's, but the melodic shaping of the phrasing is it, yeah, it could be similar. I he was the first teacher I had pretty much the first one I credit with um giving me a cassette tape yeah. and saying go home and listen to this you know because yeah. always my teachers before that always taught me to play music with my eyes they put music in front of me and say play this and i'd read it yeah and i used to improvise and i and i used to go off the page and sort of chastise myself for not working properly and not being diligent and oh, i'm just goofing around again and then i became to realize oh no I'm, I'm playing music that's not on the page that's in my that i'm hearing in my head and that's where I want to, yeah. where I want to go with it, you know, but yeah, Tony gave me a, a cassette tape. Of course, I was listening to, um, you know, the early Cats and and, and um, Stanley Tarantino was the first one for me, and then Coleman Hawkins and Ben Webster, that famous meeting album with uh, Bud Johnson's on it as well, and yeah. Harry Carney with um, Ellington. Like I can't play Sophisticated Lady without hearing Harry Carney, even though I haven't played baritone since I was yeah. a kid, you know. Yeah, and. Um, and, and Brecker, obviously, and then um, all this stuff from the radio around that time that I started listening to the radio when I was about 13 and I wanted to play the saxophone and all the stuff that came out in the 80s. So Brecker's first album, like mid to late 80s when I was in yeah. high school. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, Ornette Coleman, Virgin Beauty. I thought that was Ornette. You know, for the totality of Ornette for years was Virgin Beauty, like his late 80s stuff. And yeah. um, Tony gave me a cassette with one side was Alternate Takes a Giant Steps and the other side was Young Garbrick Works. And I had no idea which one was Train and which one was Garbrick. You know, I was so, so green, man. Yeah. <laughs> but uh, I didn't understand the, 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 I didn't really understand Coltrane, but I connected with the sound of Garbrick, you know. And, and so, I'm glad you, you mentioned that you were taught uh, music by like reading, looking at the chart and reading off a chart. And, and then, you mentioned that you were giving a cassette. Uh, so you, you were those? forced, <laughs> yeah, you were forced to listen. And so I think we are falling into uh, like the first question because this podcast is all about transcribing, uh, which is something that we all do, uh, even when we are people like, like you, you know, that are an established professional who plays professionally uh, since like 30 years now, probably, and you still transcribe. So my first question for you is why you do so? Why do you transcribe? Why? Every time I transcribe, my time and my tone gets better. You know, if I'm playing along with, with Coltrane, maybe it's just because I start to hear their sound and I'm imagining their sound in my head and hearing that more than what's actually coming out the horn. <laughs> you know, yeah. maybe that's why I sound better. I don't know, but I'm starting to hear a sound. If it's if it's Coltrane or, or Bird, I still love transcribing and Dexter. I've been transcribing again lately, or um Sydney Bechet. Like I, I I kind of for me, like I said, I started with those Garbrick and Brecker and Ornette and the eighties or an eighties Ornette and that stuff, and then went back through. There were some early cats I was into, but I missed a whole period, so I had to go back and back, and it took me about. 10 years to get comfortable with playing the music that a lot of my friends growing up played, which was um, music of, of early a century ago from New Orleans. Yeah. That, of that traditional music. Yeah. You know, and now I, um, I love Bechet. You know, I actually did a couple of projects recently and I've never liked tribute things, but I like the idea of a homage. Or, so I had this couple of gigs and I, I picked a couple of, players to focus on to choose some music for these gigs yeah. rather than it being a, a you know a tribute band or anything i'm not going to go in and tell a bunch of stories about them from their biographies yeah. or anything like that but but i, I chose to um 
I had a, a band with the older cats playing, so I focused on Sydney Bechet compositions. Yeah. And tunes I... played. And then I did a Dexter one. And, and the same thing, I got to hang out with Dexter or Sydney for a couple of months and just play along with the records. And this is when I'm in my late 40s, you know? Yeah. And uh, I, I love that, man. Still so uh, I have a curiosity because, as you know, there are a lot of transcription books about Dexter or even Sidney Bechet or uh, Coltrane. Of course, there is probably everything that Coltrane played has been transcribed and published. But I have never found a publication with Jan Garberg solos. Have you ever transcribed Ian Garberg? He's one cat, like I talk about, I ask my students if they've ever transcribed because I believe that's the most important learn. You know, I always tell them these are your two most important teachers. Yes. You know, your own ears. And, and if you can't, you know, if you could play, uh, if you can't play a, a note and sing it back, you, you, you know, you're in trouble. So, but um, if you can hear a phrase and, and play it back, if you can start to hear music as sentences rather than words or collections of letters, you know, it is you, yeah. you remember two, five, one, rather than remembering D minor seven, it's got these notes yeah. in it. And you just remember that, that four bars as a thing. And I like the letter T H E is just the, we yeah. don't even read it anymore. We just see it as a thing. And, um, but I ask students, you know, do you ever transcribe one note? And they look at me kind of funny. Yes. But Jan Garbrick is one of those guys I could play with and I have spent a whole day just trying to play one note that he plays and just get that sound. You know, Breck is another one that yeah. thing we talked about before where he lips down off a note, lips down yeah. a tone. Um, the first note on the train record, Lush Life. Train's hmm. a funny one for me. Train and, and Wayne Shorter, they everyone wanted to sound like Train and Wayne Shorter and everyone was transcribing them when I was at school. And I went, well, everyone else sounds like that. And they all sounded like, uh, you know, bad carbon copies yeah. of yeah. Train and Wayne. It, was, oh, it kind of turned me off. Like $1 know? shop sound. Right. <laughs> and so I transcribed, uh, when I was in college, I, I mean, I loved Lovano and, and Frizzell and Paul Motion Trio. That was one of my favorite things. Oh, but yes. I ended up transcribing through that, through Lovano, transcribing heaps of Bill Frizzell and um, John Schofield's band I love with Lovano again and um, Matheny's bands with, with no saxophone I loved. So they, they were three cats that I transcribed. And of course, 8081 with Brecker and Dewey. So could I say that one of the main reasons you transcribe is to get your sound to some territories that you haven't explored yet? Yeah, I guess I always, what my process was as a kid was always just putting on a tape and play along with it. And, um, and imagine I'm on stage standing next to Colin Hawkins and Ben Webster or, or whatever, whoever it's Stanley yeah. Tarantino, whoever it is. And just I play something that that they wouldn't glare at me for playing, you know, something that would fit the music, something that complements what they're playing. Not exactly what they're playing, but something that complements it and is in the sort of style or reflects it. And then occasionally I'd stop and rewind a little bit and check a little bit out. Cassettes were great because you could rewind just the yeah. tiniest bit. And while the play button was still down, you could still hear how much you were rewinding. You did this process yeah. too, right? Yeah, of course. I choose is terrible for for transcribing because you go back one second you want to go back like a fifth of a second yep. and just those two notes you could do that with the i had a really sensitive rewind on my thing i saw a thing with brecker talking about this recently in a it must have been a workshop someone filmed and he said he never transcribed a whole solo yep. but he would grab little bits like that you know yeah it's my early process for it was grabbing little um little just little segments that i liked you know yeah yeah, so I think that to that that train one, where he, he plays um, like someone in love, yeah. and he plays it in A flat, which is kind of unusual. Gets plays it there too, and um, he starts on the C in the upper mm -hmm. register on the saxophone, but he approaches it from a D, and he approaches that D approach note from a C. So we are, yeah. yeah. There's a whole series of events that happen before. Duh, you might write the chart saying. Oh, it's a C on there, but it's got a, a D approaching it. This approach from a C, and those notes, because of the nature of the saxophone, 
um, yeah, I don't know if you can see, you know, yeah. but moving between C and D, there's, you can open, how, when do you open the D key and, or when do you, yeah, when do you open and when, oh, they're both opening and then they're both, when do you open, when do you close? So something like that, uh, that inspired in me, this is, you know, transcribing one note for a day is just holding the C key. So it's C to C yeah. sharp. Yeah. And saying we 99% of that is C sharp and 1% of it is C when it's fully closed. Yeah. So can I zone in on that 1% and find out when that note is between C and C sharp? It might be two and a half percent, you know, just finding that point where the horns just between the open and close where the note changes and f focus in on that. And then I'm going to focus in on trying to open up the D key <laughs> slowly and, and a combination of lip and finger movement and then opening the D while the C is still, you know, like I call it fudging or um, <laughs> smudging it, you know, like, yeah. can I smudge the note between those? So if okay. I could... yeah. the horn's cold. If I go in slow motion, I never slow things down really, but um, I just go over and over and over them. If I slowed it down, it's kind of. Yeah, the whole phrase. So, that, I mean, it's I talk, I'm saying it's one note, but now I'm saying it's, well, there's two approach notes to the one note. But really it's yeah, but it's one thing. It's one thing, it's one and thing. It, you might spend like two weeks to get it right. I mean, you might say, you know, Johnny Hodges is another one. He might yeah. go, bo, bo, bo. Yeah. yeah. There's a whole tune in the way. Yeah, you just, play one note. just the head of Ishfahan can take you know ages to get it right. It's, there is... You're going to get inside it. That's what I want yeah. to do is get really inside it. I mean, it's great seeing people play along with transcriptions and they got all the notes right and all that. That's awesome, you know, and, and it's to be commended and it's, you know, but it, it's sort of like a computer can kind of do that. You know? Yeah. The computer can't really get inside and, and work out. So for me, the transcription, I write them down. I like to have them written down. I like to be able to go back and analyze them. Yeah, I will. I, we will. Like we will. We will go back to that. Um, how do you choose the solos you are going to transcribe? Oh. Is it like a random process or you want to work on something in particular? You might not be happy with your playing and you say, oh, I have to improve this. So I might work a little bit on this player because I know that this player has that thing that I'm missing or it's just you hear something that you love and you say, I want to know. I'm in the second camp. Okay. I, I think it, but the first camp is appealing to me. And I think maybe I should consider that a bit more now you've brought it up, <laughs> but mine is an emotional connection. You know, when I'm listening to music, Oh, I'm going to do that one now. But I mean, the Dexter one I did, um, I did, I did, you all know one from doing all right, because yeah. I did you all know one from homecoming. And I did you or no one from homecoming because I was listening in the car and heard um, Woody Shaw's solo. And actually, I wanted to transcribe that because he sounds amazing <laughs> on that yeah. live at the Vanguard. And um, but when I actually transcribe it, it's amazing. It's like when you um, when you play with someone on stage that you've listened to from the audience before, and all of a sudden there's a whole another world going on that you don't connect with. Just listen. I don't connect with just listening when I'm playing with them, all this other stuff opens up, you listen on such a deeper level mm. um, that I, what I found with listening to that Woody Shaw solo and then the Dexter is Woody kind of, you know, when they're playing fast, he's kind of behind the, the beat a little bit. Dexter can be way behind the beat, but he never sounds awkward or uncomfortable. Yeah. It's inc yeah. <laughs> incredible. Yeah. You know, he does this, the opening phrase to that, um, to that first, solo on homecoming it's like the last track i think um his time you know because i think of dexter has often been behind the time but 
his time on the opening phrase is so on the money. It's um. <laughs> <laughs> right on the beat and then the next phrase it's almost like it's in slow motion and it's an elastic band that he's pulling apart you know yeah the end of four almost comes after the downbeat of one it's like it's a fourth so dimension yeah he goes like this and then the next phrase is like whoa it's, you've got this whole world of um playing uh, uh, of different places to place things within the beat that he's very aware of. So I, I guess our listener uh, would just realize that uh, in all our episodes, I, I can al almost foresee that almost nobody will talk about actually the notes, but it's all about <laughs> what's true. behind the notes. Right. Because this is what it is. Also with my students, I always say, you first get the notes and that's like a preparation for your work. Your work hasn't started yet. You have to have the solo down with all the notes and all the rhythms and then your work starts. Mm. Uh, a lot of people think that once they got all the notes, it's finished. No, it, it actually starts there. <laughs> You know, and then you go into the nuances, into the articulation, into the sound, or into the breathing or vibrato. Come on, let's talk about vibrato. You know, it's my first teacher, my first jazz teacher, let me spend like three months on Lester Young vibrato. And he was very strict. I was going to the lesson, I was driving all the way down to Rome from Florence. And every month, I was, okay, I'm playing the, the Lester Young thing. And he was saying, no, vibrato, <laughs> vibrato is, is not that. Oh, but isn't it this? No. And and made me understanding that it is what's behind the notes that makes that music interesting and, you know, emotional, that moves you. It's not just the note. We we are all playing the same twelve notes in the chromatic scale, but we are still fascinating by a player or another player, and we are all different. You know, someone might not like Sonny Rollins, and it's fine. But the reason is not that doesn't like the notes that Sonny Rollins plays, doesn't like the way Sonny Rollins plays. So it's funny you were talking about driving because I was yeah. thinking about a, a driving analogy and it hasn't occurred to me before, but maybe because, you know, I'm thinking about the Ferraris and stuff, but it, it, it's like, um, it's very hard to teach a student how, how to play. We can teach them what to play yeah. and I can give someone nuts and bolts, yeah. but I can't teach them. I can't give them experience only that you they can only play their own experience. So I was thinking when you're talking about driving, it's like, um, for teaching the nuts and bolts is like the mechanical we're teaching someone how to build a car and that's very precise and you need to know what thread goes with the screw and they fit together but but teaching someone how to drive the car is an emotional thing you know especially if you're driving beyond the level of um normal control yeah right not in you with your l plates driving up but you know uh, what do they call it in japan yeah where they uh what do they call that, man? Uh, I don't know. Where they slide the cars, you know? Oh, yeah. Uh, I don't know. <laughs> There's a name for it. So it's yeah. out of control and it's, you know, if to turn left, you have to turn right. Yes. It's that kind of, it's an intuitive and an emotional and it's a reaction, a reactive thing of playing. It's funny you know, because I... Experience. No matter how much you transcribe someone else, when you're in that moment, all you can do is express yourself. Kind of I use the same analogy, but to describe improvisation. Right. I, I say traffic, driving in the traffic is the most exciting and powerful collective free improvisation that you can imagine. Mm. Because you know your starting point and you know your destination and you know the rules and Lastly, you know how to drive the car. You know how to play your instrument. But 
all the rest, you don't know anything about it. You don't know whether there will be, you know, raining or it will be a sunshine day. You don't know where there will be a traffic jam or someone who just, you know, takes a red light. And, and you have to be prepared to steer at the last minute. And I always feel the same when I play jazz. You know, I, I have to be prepared. So I practice at home, but I don't practice playing. I just practice to be able to play my instrument and to be able to steer last minute to a direction. Yeah, so practicing technique and then leaving, leaving the music for the gig. Yes. Because you have to be in the moment, like you can't be thinking about what happened. In the moment, but when you are in the traffic, you don't know. And you are in the moment and you have to be able to predict the behavior of the other drivers if you want to be safe. You know? So there is a, an interplay in the traffic and sometimes things are going wrong. And sometimes you go back home after a gig and you feel ashamed of you know, how you played and how it went, as well as sometimes you go home and you smash your car somewhere you know, <laughs> and, and things go very badly. Um, so it, it's funny that you use the same analogy. Um, moving on, uh, I think you already replied to this question, but why do you write it down? I like to write it down so I can uh, analyze it, you know, it helps me to analyze it with my eyes. Maybe even if I, even if I look at it and say, well, that's a long phrase or wow, he uses a lot of space, <laughs> you know, yeah. simple things that you can see like that, or you can see shape or, um, I mean, sometimes I write the chords on normally I know the, the tune, you know, I mean, here's, this is one of, that's one I've been doing. So it's yeah. all in pencil, you know, yeah. sometimes I've, I don't really see the point anymore of, um, punching it into the computer. Yeah. Okay, again, you know, like maybe I could get my an assistant to do that if I get that. Yeah. You know, if I wanted to show it to someone, I, I might have it in the computer. That's great. Um, if I wouldn't have had three kids, I would have had be happy to be your assistant, Julian. Maybe you get maybe you've got but, three assistants there, but I, I, I Oh, yeah, like I can teach them. <laughs> <laughs> and assign them a task you need to transcribe Julian. So it's interesting because when I've done a transcription fully on the computer, it takes a little longer for me than the pencil or the pen. It's not as yeah. um, quick in my process of it. Yeah. Maybe if I use the keyboard's quicker, but I somehow I don't learn it in the same way either. Yeah. And sometimes I've done transcriptions. There's a lot of ways of doing it. I could I could um, do it just with the saxophone. I could do it um, with the piano. You know, or I could try and do it without an instrument at all. Mm. I find if I do every phrase with the saxophone, I really learn the solo and I can play it by memory by the time I finished. Yeah, and Whereas this is the next just by, just by ear or with the piano, I don't have that connection with it. This was my to... next next question. Could you um, tell us a little bit about the process that you? Uh, put in place when you transcribe? Do you do like a whole phrase or one bar, two bars or uh, a whole section like eight bars? What's the process you like to... Sometimes I, um, sometimes I only do one phrase, you know, and I use that to practice for the rest of the day. That's my favorite. And that, that's what uh, the phrase might come from a book. It might come from a classical piece, piece of music. It might come from an exercise book or um, something, a chart someone sent to me that I'm trying to learn, or it might come from Slaninsky or, or from um, like the use of Latif book. I really love getting things out of, or it might just be me saying, oh, look, here, here, I'm going to practice major third today. This is what yeah. I have the most fun practicing. Yeah. One or two intervals, two or three notes, and then trying to, combine them together in as many different ways as possible and just and play and and sort of put it into a musical context i guess yeah. taking those putting them into tunes and this is i play the transcription sorry i think i'm skipping forward to to something else you're possibly going to ask me about that's fine uh, playing the transcriptions but um 
I when I some I like to finish a solo because I'm very bad at finishing things. <laughs> so I have a thing about. Finishing I, I, solo. I, th- I think it's all right if. I should have done the last head too. Yeah. I like to do the head too. You know, I like to do the melody as well. The way they play that. And do you use any software to do it? I got a thing called the Amazing Slow Downer. Yep. And uh, I got another one called Transcribe Seventh String yep. by Andy Robertson. And uh, I really like both of those. And I only really ever used it when I was doing uh, this project a few years ago with Lenny Tristano and huh. uh, Lee Connors' music, right? Yep. And and what I use it because I found some charts for that stuff, but it's all got um, maybe it's from other versions. But yeah, it wasn't correct. It's full of so mistakes. I so I, I, I wanted to get it right. You know, I've got another book of transcriptions because one time I went in the shop and I humbugged them for like three, four hours about instruments. And I went out without buying anything. I thought I got to leave some money in the store. So I bought yeah. a book of Coltrane transcriptions. And the thing I like about that is um, the ones that I've already done, I can go and check them against someone else's version. Yeah. Oh, yeah, I, I got that bit wrong. Or, no, I, I don't think. That's what happens there. What yeah. they said, I think, you know, because but you hear things different ways too, especially with those. We looked at some transcriptions before we started this interview, and the, the X notes or the crosses or the ghosted notes or the. And I do find when you slow it down that you hear things in a different way. Maybe it's more. Can it be more precise but less accurate? Do you know what I yeah. mean? Like we can use these different words, like bright and dark. What do they yeah. really mean? Back in the days, I had a Pioneer CD player and it didn't have any fuzzy function. I remember that when CD players came out, there was the Philips brand who first introduced the AB button that you could loop. You could loop, yeah, great. You know, a section, but I didn't have it because probably it was too expensive. But I had a Pioneer. And that model that I had, I don't know if it was a bug or if, if it was built like that, but every time you played like the, the steel button and then press play again, it was kind of going back like half a second. That's a long so, time. So I developed the skill of like pressing the steel button and the play button and repeat... <laughs> Repeat yeah. like even two notes, like tiro 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 tiro, and then I started singing tiro 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 tiro, and then press stop and tiro tiro and right, find those play. notes. Yes, yeah. so you have to sing it for, and then then you don't even have to. <laughs> there's this musical version of pin the tail on the donkey, you know. Yeah. Tiro 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 tiro. Oh, there it is. You know. So yeah, yeah. man, you miss it one. Okay, you might not get it the first time, but when you miss it the first time. Now you can make a more educated guess. Yeah. Stop and think about it. Okay. You know, then it nearly always comes rather than this kind of, ah, <laughs> you know, stabbing in the dark thing. Yeah. yeah. So yeah, the, my tape player was the same. I could press rewind while it was still playing and you'd hear it go back and you could actually yeah. hear where in the music it was. And so yeah. I developed this really soft finger, uh, a, a soft touch would go slower than a, a heavier touch on the rewind. Tape players were amazing for it. Yeah. And here's well, an interesting thing. My students always say now that they, they do everything from YouTube because YouTube has a slow downer in it. You can pick yeah. different speed. It doesn't but only 75%. All right. Well, I use um, the transcribe, seventh string transcribe program yeah. has a, a loop function like that and it tries to guess yeah. the notes on sometimes, but that's a disaster because there's yeah. all the other things going on. Uh, but it has the the loop and it has the slow down the different speeds and yeah that's a, but like i said you hear different things at different speeds i think yes yes you hear the playing, the breath yeah i have started playing this thing oh, i'm wearing the strap i was looking yeah. for the strap before because i've been doing some in slow motion or 50 percent i start hearing like <laughs> So I'm actually playing, transcribing the slow motion as well, you know? Uh, 
uh, my lips doing some funny things now. But Julian, we that... should put together a band where we play everything in slow motion and call it like transcriptions. <laughs> and... the guy that plays yeah. backwards? No. <laughs> man, uh, I can't. I don't know his name, man. Barney played this New York alto player, and he's transcribed bird backwards. Backwards. And he can improvise like that now. <laughs> It's not, it's insane, man. Because he, yeah. he did it so much, he learned how to improvise kind of like backwards bird lines. And he's paid negative dollars for his gigs. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> All right. But you have to use the technology you have available. I, I um, guess you guys, you know, people. Because my dad, players, my dad had a, one of those like tape suitcases it was called in italian fono valigia like mm. fono fono suitcase and he was playing on cruises so on the board he used to transfer the long planes uh onto his big tape recorder and it had a switch half speed ah, yeah, yeah. but there was a problem that half speed went down an octave of course. so so like a tenor saxophone was like a bass saxophone like boo, 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 boo. but he could he could use it to transcribe like yeah but there's pictures yeah. of train in the hotel room um there's one after eric dolphy died he has a picture of eric on the wall and he has a little tape recorder in the room with him yeah and i think he was recording gigs there's a guy in boston who recorded a bunch of train gigs in the 60s early 60s and um, Frank Tiberi, his name is. He taught. Yeah. Um, yeah. You know Frank. Frank's like yeah. ninety two or something now. Yeah. He taught Lovano and Gazzo and those cats and and uh, yeah, he recorded all his gigs in the sixties and he'd go and transcribe them after the gig at night, transcribing train. You know, apparently there. I had a few friends that have heard some of them and they're amazing. But then there's Frank kicks a bag sometimes and then he's him swearing. You know. <laughs> <laughs> You would be if you were sitting listening to the train, you'd rip out a couple of expletives. Yeah, <laughs> yeah you're right. <laughs> uh, uh, Julian, well, some... think... yeah. sorry, something <laughs> I'm, I'm always curious, uh, because one of the most common replies when I ask someone to transcribe or a student uh, say, oh, you should start transcribing, why don't you... Uh, Sometimes the reply is, oh, I don't like the idea of uh, becoming a copy of someone. Mm. Uh, I think that most of the times it's just an excuse because they are lazy and they don't want to, you know, <laughs> sweat uh, to achieve uh, a good transcription. But have you ever felt uh, that you were risking you know you were going down a path and ended up playing like someone else like replicating know, someone I, else I, I, and how I, did you how did you avoid it i i, I don't think it's possible i mean uh, i i mean I, I i knew a couple of cats when i went to boston that were 10 years younger than me they were 18 17 and one of them sounded like dexter and one of them sounded like Bagonzi. you know they had all the language down but they weren't those guys you know, and I heard um, Sanborn, David Sanborn, getting his horn fixed once, and he just played blues and bebop licks, really, you know, to test out the saxophone and then give it back to the repairman and then play. He didn't play all the the pop kind of saccharine stuff that he's known for. Yeah. But it was unmistakably him. Yeah. You know, I can hear like the truth, you know. When you hear someone lie, you can hear 20 different lies and you're not sure if they're a truth. But when you hear the Dalai Lama, you know it's the truth. <laughs> yeah. oh, that's so simple. I knew that. You go, I knew that all along. But I, I had to be reminded of it in a clear, simple way and told with love <clears throat> for yeah. me to um, to accept how simple it is. Because it's easy to forget because uh, things get so complicated. you know. Um, so if I transcribe... Um, well, you know, I'm going to transcribe Dexter, I'm going to transcribe Train, I transcribe Sonny, I transcribe Stanley Tarantino, Ben Webster, Colin Hawkins, Sidney Bechet, Brecker, um, Tony Malaby, Ellery Esculin, I mean, you know, like all, all this other um, eras of, I mean, they're just the tenor players. Yeah. Um, 
they're all going to give me something different. And at the end of the day, I can't take away my own experience and I can only reflect my own experience. And um, when I get on the bandstand, hopefully I forget all that stuff and I'm not trying to play you all the licks that I've played and things that I know will work, but I'm just trying to relax and let the music flow through me and let what should happen happen, right? Yeah. Which is a really hard thing to do. Again, it's sort of like the analytical mind and the emotional mind and you need to be in a an open state to improvise or a non-judgmental state but then you're in the recording studio and you go and listen back and you have to be analytical because otherwise you're blowing money and you didn't get a good take of it you know is that is yeah. that good enough you know yes judgmental analytical mind and then you've got to turn that off to play because it'll destroy you when you try and play so no i don't think you run any risk of liebman said it beautifully you know <laughs> Um, Dave Liebman said, you know, it, people won't say, oh, um, Charlie, you know, Frank's playing the, I heard him there in his solo, he's playing the third chorus, um, the bridge, of, the third bar of the bridge of the third chorus of Cannibal Adderley's solo on Love for Sale. They just go, man, Frank's sounding great this week, isn't he? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> he had another analogy about um, carpentry and cooking, and, and this isn't his analogy about the cooking, but it occurred to me, if you just say, oh, I'm just going to make it up, your food's going to taste like shit yeah. for a long, long time, you know, until you, I mean, if you can read a few recipes and then, you know, you make a few different curries and then maybe you try your own, you know, or you run out of curry powder. What could I make curry powder with? I might use some black mustard, some yellow mustard seeds, maybe a bit of fenugreek. Should I toast that first or should I put it in afterwards? You know, what order? Uh, I, I've got some curry leaves in the, in the backyard. Maybe I'll try them and so, you know, like, yeah, yeah, that tasted like shit too. Maybe I'll try something different next time. <laughs> but uh, Liebman said a great one about furniture. First of all, he said, um, if you're going to be a chef, you get a job washing dishes for the best chef in town and just watch him and just try and glean things off him. And, and you don't go and watch some guy flip burgers at the burger joint. You know, you try and work in the best restaurant. Or if you want to do carpentry, you, you, you know, you, you, you see a desk you like and what do you do? you destroy it. <laughs> I mean, you pull it apart. My brother was classic at this and repairmen that often have this kind of mind too. They want to yeah. pull everything apart, see how it works and yeah. then put it back together. And then often the act of putting it back together is, Oh, how can I make this better? Or new mouthpiece makers. Oh, I just made an auto link copy, but it's better, more modern, brighter, something. <laughs> you know, they always have to tinker with it somehow. You got to yeah. put something of yourself into it, or it's pointless. Yeah, I mentioned in, in one of the previous episodes of the podcast that I come from Florence, right? And Florence is where Renaissance took place, and I I grew up with all those stories about those artists like Michelangelo, Leonardo da Vinci, Ghiberti, and Giotto they didn't go to the art school. They were admitted into one master's workshop. And mm. for like the first four or five years, they, they were blessed to be able to stay inside and watch the master working. So the master was saying, okay, I can see that your son was talking to the father of the young kid right? I can see that your kid has some talent, he can come, but he has to sit on that chair and shut up the whole time. And after a few years, he may ask, oh, can you prepare the colors for me? But for, for the first years, you don't say anything, you just mm. watch. And because, and they were never teaching those guys. You know, but they they could learn everything. They could learn the basics, the technique, how you do things, and then you use your creativity to do your own stuff. Who's the guy who makes the movies like um, Black Cat, White Cat, with the Bulgarian? Is they Bulgarian? There's a band that's part of the movie, and they're always following the main. Yeah, guys, right? it's um, uh, uh, the guy that has made. Also, movies with the Kochani Orchestra. Um, is he Bulgarian or... Uh, no, he's Yugoslavian. 
Yugoslavian, right? Yeah. yeah. I think there's a movie with them, and that all the um, adults are playing music, and all the kids are sitting there with their instruments too, and they're playing along the whole yeah. time, man. Not in the band, but they're in the back. You know, they're just watching from distance, and they're just absorbing it. And the traditional cultures are like that as well. The, the kids are all. They're learning the dances, they're learning the music, learning the rhythms, they're learning the, you know, how to get painted up, the traditions, the making the clothes, the painting, everything kind of goes together. Our culture is very weird that we um, separate a bit. Well, not even I'm going to be a musician, but I'm going to play the tenor saxophone. Yeah. And I'm going to study, I'm going to try and play in the style of George Coleman around 1964 in Miles's band, you know. Yeah. Like the um, focus can be as narrow or as wide as you want it to be. But in Western culture, where we're so um, uh, focused on individuality and on individual pursuits in our own places, I mean, lockdown is a classic for it, yeah. you know, because we're isolated from everyone else yeah. and we're just doing our own thing. And in a way, um, I didn't want to get around to this, but we're in a unique position to deal with this because we've spent eight hours a day in a room alone for our whole life preparing for this you know it's, yes. it's not i mean i miss the gigs you know yeah now the gigs are on again i can sack my therapist <laughs> but uh, you know i guess it's all this emotional stuff that comes from it as well it's not just playing music i mean playing music with other people is such another level and if i go to play music with other people and i try and force my licks from my dexter Gordon transcription on them. Yeah. I'm not playing music with them. Like you say, if you're driving the car and you're, you know, thinking about something else, you can, you're probably going to get in, in an accident mm. or maybe in a fight with one of them. You know, you, you're not listening to me. What's going yeah. on? Yeah. So, um, yeah. so by the way, the about transcription, but I just want to say, I think that transcription is almost exactly the same process as improvising. The only difference is transcription is copying something someone else says and having the time to slow it down maybe with a machine or whatever and improvising is transcribing what's happening in my head in real time in the spot so by transcribing i practice what a fifth feels like what a sixth feels like what a phrase feels like what so i can play some i can think about it and it and comes out without me having to think of spelling all the words so when That's I speak, great. I don't think I'm telling the words. Yeah, I think it's just, I think great. it's incredibly close, close to the same experience, even though it feels like copying someone else and the other feels like expressing yourself. It's actually the same process, isn't it? Yeah. Uh, <laughs> I checked the the director. Director's name is Kusturica. He's he's right. Serbian. So I checked online. I. Mirko, what's your process when you have the transcription? Do you then, um, I mean, you play along like we watched some videos before of people who can yeah. play a match and their eighth notes are exactly the same, or the color that's not in black and whites on the page. You get all that stuff there. You could turn the transcription off and you could still play along with it in time. Yeah. And then turn the transcription back on, you're still there. But what else do you do with transcription after that? I, I like to apply a methodology that actually Dave Liebman taught me. Uh, that you start, uh, you learn the solo, you memorize the solo. Like one of my favorite is probably Stan Gates of uh, Stella by Starlight. Yeah, yeah. Uh, out from that album called Stan Gates Plays. And I have transcribed the whole album because I loved in, it so in G, much. Right? Yeah, he plays in yeah. G. And there are some chord substitutions that are not common anymore on that tune does he play the diminished for the first two bars uh is half diminished the first chord and then oh, dominant okay. yeah yeah there's a, there's a lot of ways around that you know yeah but uh so i got the solo down i can play the solo i can play along with the track or with a metronome because you know i learned it pretty well and then I start playing with the recording, but I change probably 10% of it. Mm. So I still play the solo and I still sing the solo in my head, but I might start a line a little bit later or instead of going up, I just finish the phrase going down. 
And then I keep playing. And then after three, four quarters, I just play 80% stun gates, 20% of my staff. And then after four choruses, I play 40% uh, of my staff. Mm -hmm. And That's if I... Like the Connets 10-step method. Yeah. Method yeah, a little... A little bit like that, but uh, w with a solo. So it's actually a nice process to don't feel trapped into the net of, you know, I have to play that note. No, because I know so well the shape of that line that I can control it in real time. And as you said it, it's very interesting what you said, that you are transcribing what you hear in your head. And it's probably this process helps you to speed it up, that process. Mm -hmm. Because you have something in your head, which is the Stangates line, but I can change it. Last minute, I can, nope, i go here. Yeah. Or, yeah, right. or I unlong it. There is, when he plays the melody, he plays this incredible, tricky line on the bridge where he plays like uh, um, uh, Hemiola, so he plays like three, three, uh, two, three, three, two, two, three, three, two, two, three, two, three. Uh, it's incredible. And when I try to apply that methodology I was describing, I like to have a lot of fun there. And instead of playing, I can play, because I know the shape of the line, and I have analyzed it, so I know the nuts and bolts, as you said, mm. and I can rem remount it, you know, but putting that bolt instead of putting here, I put underneath, you know, mm. and create with the same pieces. It's like having Lego, you know, and you create a different shape with the same pieces. And this process is very interesting because you get to the point where you start still think a portion of that solo but is no more recognizable is no more me playing stangets but is me playing something while i remember stangets right yeah i i mean even if i can i play something i'll try not to <laughs> i would love to but if i play just the line that you were singing yeah, I heard something like this. Yeah. I heard that I'm playing from, it sounded to me like you're coming from the fifth. I might start on the seventh. Or I might play it uh, going up. Or, or with yeah it's exactly from, from not chord tones but leading those so exactly yeah or i'm sorry widening the intervals out exactly. or, or, or playing into the phrase or playing out of the phrase or trying to incorporate that phrase into yeah. the middle of it, or playing it up instead of down i mean is that backwards or is it reversing the direction yeah. <laughs> i might play it minor yeah. sorry you got me on my gets <laughs> or you can extending the line out you know so at the end of the day i've got i think we're saying the same thing 40 or 50 different phrases that all come from and are informed and inspired by that stan gets yeah. lick yeah without just cut and pasting yeah. that stan get and i can or... play it in all now you know I mean, I don't want to play a solo in all 12 keys, but what I like to do is transpose, hey puppy, transpose <laughs> a solo within the key. Yes. You know, so playing it off the seventh instead of off the fifth, playing it off yes. the higher. Yeah. <laughs> or also meshing up 
the players. Like you can play as think it's <laughs> line, thinking of called train playing that line. Right. Right. And well, so instead of like you can play yeah. right and It's the same notes that Stan gets played, but they sound different. So that's really interesting playing a Stan gets transcription in the style of train or in the style yeah. of the wolf. I like that. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah, it's great, man. And it means if you're able to do it, it means that you have learned the concept behind the sound of that player, not just the notes, because as I said, the notes are always the same. We are using the same notes that. Mozart or uh, Shostakovich or right. I don't know uh, Balapikola. Twelve notes, man. <laughs> yeah. Know. Yeah. Anyway, and without uh, context, they're all the same. All twelve of them are the same. I mean, if you don't have perfect pitch and you know, and you yeah. have just one note by itself, well, it doesn't mean anything. That's right. <laughs> <laughs> so I think we are heading to the very last question and it's probably the most difficult one, Julian. Uh, I hope you don't blame me for that. Which transcribed solo is your favorite? Oh, if you have one. I, I think it'd be the last one I did. With you or, It's you or no one, Dexter. For now, you know, because it's the one that's in my head the most, but... Um, I, that one of Coltrane, um, like someone in love, that's just a masterpiece. Yeah. I mean, train on blue train. When I transcribe that, I um, learn how to play it, and it's quite fast, you know. Yeah. It's a, but and um, then I went, it kind of occurred to me, man, this person is thinking at that speed and performing immaculately. Like it took me a long time to be able to perform it cleanly and clearly because it's fast and it's tricky around the horn. But he's just creating at that speed like it's like it's nothing you know um the the um sunny rollins on um olio i think when i transcribed that i didn't realize quite what a bebop of sunny rollins was you know the live version or the the studio version the live version is like 30 minutes long <laughs> yeah no i didn't do that one no the studio version where he trades fours max yeah you know? yeah that's genius that's absolute genius and there's little things in that, you know, there's a line from that that I, I try to got rid of, but it's just stuck in there. It's probably all it is, but I've remembered it as. But I'll play it as. Oh, I'm messing it up, man, of course. Yeah. So I'll turn the whole thing into an exercise. That's the other thing is that yeah. there's four notes. It sounds a bit like the Nokia. Sorry? It sounds a bit like the Nokia mobile phone yeah, alarm, right. you know? <laughs> there's, a, there's a Dexter one too. every note you know yeah talking early. about talking about like trademarks sony rollins <laughs> right? uh, and you have to get that second c uh fingering the low one because you have to have that dirty sound like right? and right. if you just finger the normal c you don't get the same sound. It has to be like a, a, a bastard note, right? It's like that train one I mentioned, this one. Right. For me, I mean, it comes from, from Leicester, I reckon. 
So, you know, playing the D in the lower register with that fingering. So right. again, when I'm transcribing, I'm thinking, what, and trains are classic, is he using side B flat or bis B flat? Yeah. We could argue about that forever. We could never know. Probably both. Because you know, <laughs> he probably uses all the buttons on the horn. Yeah. I can't believe, man, when I have students and I say, do, when you play chromatic scale, do you use this button? And they go, which which button? I go, that one. They go, oh, I've never seen that one. How long have you been yeah. playing saxophone? Seven years. <laughs> You're kidding me. You never noticed, you never said, what does that one do? You know? You know what I say to the, <laughs> what I say to those students is, do you have the jazz articulation button? <laughs> this one. Oh, and I good. say, what do you mean? I mean that if I if I press it and now I'm I'm pressing it, whatever I apply, even if it's a scale. <laughs> But if I want to play classical, I just <laughs> and and they try and it doesn't work and I say, oh, maybe it's broken. You should bring the saxophone to someone. <laughs> like, and the other thing is, the other thing is, is the tuning, the tuning key. You know this one when I say, oh, you're oh, a bit yeah, sharp. Yeah, can yeah, you can fix? important, man. <laughs> Can you tune it? <laughs> I don't know if I've told you about my young student. He's been coming since he's nine. He's like 11 now. And we do most things by ear. I try to get him to read, but we're taught him by ear. So he, but he just has curiosity. So he comes in and he says, on the first lesson, he goes, what's the lowest note and the highest note? So oh, you won't be able to play them. Maybe the second <laughs> lesson. And I show him low B flat and high F and he can play them, man. He plays the F in tune. I'm like, That's amazing. Right? Right. And, um, then he comes in, he says, hey, I, I worked out if I play this note and I press this button, this happens. Or if I press this button, this happens. Okay, man, that's awesome. And he's finding these. Uh, all right, show me that one. E with, yeah. e with the B flat key on. Sam, that's amazing, man. Show me. He showed me about three or four, and I filmed them and I took them to my students <laughs> at Monash. And I said, "Try this finger." Is that? Oh, is that from the 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 Russia book? Is that from the yeah. you know the YouTube Russo book? No, man. My nine year old student Sam showed <laughs> me this shit, man, because he's curious and it had that. Yeah. What if I do this thing? Like, what is everything exactly. on it? You know, find your way to play what you hear. Right, my um, my my boy's just. I don't know if you can see this. Can you just down yeah. in the bottom? Yeah, he's just, he's just. I've got this thing on. The, I've started putting a bit of cardboard on the floor for the spit. You know. Yeah. I've become more aware lately, but um, he's just ripped it up because I'm ignoring <laughs> him. <laughs> hey, boyo. Anyway, Jules has been a real pleasure. I Man, think. Nice to chat with you about that man i sent you a couple of um things just there's a brecker phrase and i've just put it up and down and back to front kind of thing there's two phrases and i'm yeah, them together maybe we can maybe to look at if you're happy we can put a link on the on the website of the podcast and mm. uh, for sure i will put the link to your website and for everyone who is listening whenever uh, you come to melbourne you have to check out jules uh, because he's a legend and he won't uh, delude you. So well, if he's playing in town, go out and listen to him and you won't regret doing that. I look forward to seeing and hearing you in public again, Marco. Yeah. So thanks. And I really thank you for this time and the contribution to this podcast. I hope that you know the, the listeners will appreciate this and will feel more inspired to explore this wonderful music and awesome. all those artists that we love and we transcribe. Uh, so thank you and I hope you enjoyed also this episode and come back on the podcast every month there will be a new episode uh, for you to listen to and thanks for listening and see you or hear you next time. Bye.